Hi, my name is Dr. Stephen Wagesback from the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Pediatric thyroid cancer is a rare thyroid malignancy, so very few cases are diagnosed during the pediatric years. Most cases of pediatric thyroid cancer will actually be diagnosed during the teenage years. Papillary thyroid carcinoma represents the most common subtype of thyroid cancer and represents about 90% of thyroid cancers in this age group. That's followed by follicular carcinomas of the thyroid that represent about 5 to 10% of the cases. And then there's medullary thyroid carcinoma, which represents less than 5%. During childhood, most cases of medullary thyroid carcinoma are related to a hereditary condition called multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2, in which case the child has inherited a mutation in the RET proto-oncogene from one of his or her parents. The incidence of thyroid cancer in the pediatric population has also been increasing similar to what's been described in the adult population. Most of these increases have actually been identified in the teenage group. The exact cause of pediatric thyroid cancer remains unknown, except for those cases of medullary carcinoma due to a germline RET mutation. We know that radiation exposure to the thyroid is a significant risk factor for the development, particularly of papillary thyroid carcinoma. Otherwise, we usually don't know what causes thyroid cancer in the pediatric population. Recently, we've come to understand better the molecular events that are associated with thyroid cancer. In the pediatric population, the mutations that have been identified to occur in thyroid cancer actually look different compared with the adult population. We tend to see more gene rearrangements called RET-PTC rearrangements compared with BRAF mutations, which are more commonly seen in older patients. In general, the treatment of pediatric thyroid cancer is best done at centers of excellence where there are multidisciplinary teams that can address all of the needs of the child. Pediatric thyroid cancer is primarily treated with surgery, and it is critical to identify a high-volume thyroid cancer surgery when contemplating who's going to perform the surgery on a child with newly diagnosed thyroid cancer. In general, children with papillary thyroid carcinoma are at a very high risk of metastases or spread to lymph nodes in the neck. And 80% or more of children may ultimately be identified to have lymph node metastases. Therefore, it's very critical upfront to identify children who would benefit from also undergoing neck dissection at the same time as initial thyroidectomy. Since neck dissections require more expertise and put the patient more at risk for complications, such as injury to the voice box or injury to the parathyroid gland, it is critical to identify a surgeon who performs thyroid cancer surgeries routinely. In the inaugural 2015 guidelines for the management of children with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer, it is recommended that the surgeon should perform at least 30 cervical endocrine procedures per year. Prior to surgery, it's important to completely stage the patient. What that means is one should get a comprehensive neck ultrasound to look for evidence of disease spread to the lymph nodes, particularly on the sides of the neck. And if something is identified there, a preoperative biopsy is recommended. The biopsy is important because if there's disease there, it is now understood that the child would benefit from removal of the lymph nodes in that part of the neck. Preoperative staging may also include the use of other studies such as CAT scan or MRI, and this is particularly critical in children who have clearly palpable lymph node disease or if there is a concern for fixation of the primary tumor to underlying structures such as the trachea. Although the use of iodinated contrast, which is actually critical in performing a neck CT to be able to distinguish benign from malignant appearing lymph nodes will delay slightly the ability to do further assessment and treatment with radioactive iodine. That should be no reason not to get the appropriate study preoperatively so that the surgeon can see the exact location of the cancer and perform the best job they can in removing all of the affected lymph nodes. After surgery is undertaken for pediatric differentiated thyroid cancer, 
then there is a period afterwards during which we do what's called post-operative staging. The extent of post-operative staging actually depends on what the pathology shows from the original surgery. In a child who has a very small localized tumor without any lymph node metastases or concerns for distant metastases, checking a postoperative serum thyroglobulin may be all that's necessary to stage the patient. And if that's undetectable, the child can be monitored with routine ultrasounds and thyroglobulin levels. In a child who's had lymph node metastases, particularly the child who has extensive lymph node disease or is known to have lung metastases, it is then recommended that the child have postoperative staging with a radioactive iodine scan. This scan is typically done a few weeks to even a few months after surgery. The child is prepared for the radioactive iodine scan typically by following a low iodine diet for a couple of weeks. At the time of the scan, a small test dose is given to the patient and then 24 hours later, a picture is made to see exactly where the iodine is distributed in the body. At the same time, we check a tumor marker, the thyroglobulin level, to see if it's elevated or not, noting that this is only valid if there are no thyroglobulin antibodies present in the serum. Depending on the tumor marker at the time of the scan and the actual scan results, then further decisions are made regarding radioactive iodine treatment. As some examples, if the child has a diagnostic scan and a detectable stimulated thyroglobulin and has extensive uptake in the sides of the neck, then that might be a situation where additional surgery might be favored for that child. If the child has evidence of uptake in the lungs, then radioactive iodine therapy would be prescribed. In the child who has either no or very minimal uptake in the thyroid bed where the thyroid once lived, and if the tumor marker is negative, then that's a child who may not require radioactive iodine and who could probably be safely monitored without further intervention. The radioactive iodine dose is determined in general based upon the extent of the disease. The reason why we wait at least 12 months between doses of radioactive iodine is that it's become recognized that the effects of radioactive iodine can actually take several years to appreciate. Therefore, our current approach is to give a single dose of radioactive iodine and then to monitor the child over the course of the next months to years. If the thyroglobulin is declining and if imaging shows regression of the sites of metastatic disease, then Currently, we tend to hold tight before giving additional doses of radioactive iodine. In the child who has evidence of persistent disease or progressive disease, then additional doses of radioactive iodine are considered. What's more difficult to know is how to treat the child who's been given a high dose of radioactive iodine and still has a mildly detectable thyroglobulin that's not rising. Further studies will be necessary to understand if that child should be treated more frequently up front, or if additional doses of radioactive iodine can be safely delayed. Children who have multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2 have inherited a mutation in the RET proto-oncogene that increases their risk for developing medullary thyroid carcinoma during the course of their lifetime. The risk of medullary thyroid carcinoma, meaning how early or not that child will develop medullary carcinoma, depends on the underlying mutation. The most severe situation is a child with multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2b, which is secondary to a codon 918 mutation in the RET proto-oncogene. Children who inherit that particular mutation can develop medullary thyroid carcinoma even within the first few months of life and current guidelines recommend removing the thyroid before the age of one in that situation. For other RET mutations, the risk of medullary thyroid carcinoma is not as great, and current guidelines suggest that one can safely monitor that child with annual calcitonin levels and intermittent ultrasound studies. Certainly, the decision at what age to perform an early or prophylactic thyroidectomy is ultimately best made after discussion with the patient's family as well as the treating surgeon and endocrinologist.